Okay, we are now recording. Good morning and welcome to the CTSC webinar for September 26, 2016. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Today's topic is the tragedy of the commons, presented by Apache Software Foundation's David Nally. CTSC is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about CTSC can be found at trustedci.org. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box provided here. And uh, we also accept uh, questions at the end of the presentation. Having said all of that, I will hand the microphone over to David. David, welcome. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, and, and thanks, everyone, for coming. I know, especially if you're on the West Coast, this is an early morning uh, and an early Monday morning for you. Uh, so thanks for showing up. Uh, hopefully, it'll be beneficial to you. Um, so real quickly, my... Uh, contact information's here. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me uh, via email. And feel free, uh, feel free to contact me if you have questions or you have vehement disagreements. Uh, both are welcome. Uh, and I hope that this, um, this ends up being a good conversation. Um, so real quickly, a little bit about me. I I've been involved in open source for a while. Um, the really old folks in open source uh, think I'm still a youngster. And the folks who've only been in open source for you know, five or six years think I've been around forever. Uh, so I'm in a weird place. Uh, I started contributing to open source in the early 2000s. And um, so I was, I was around in 2002, 2003, working on some of my first open source projects and then kind of uh, started contributing heavily to a number of others. In 2006, I was uh, part of the Fedora project, which is a Linux distribution. I ended up doing virtually all of the roles there, everything from working on infrastructure, writing documentation, packaging software, uh, helping ship releases, and ended up being on their board of directors. Uh, I then uh, got involved in a couple of other things, and my perspective on it was always as a user because I worked in the operations space. I was a sysadmin. I was employed as a sysadmin until about 2010 when someone said, hey, would you like to come work on open source full time? I've got a project for you to work on. And that led me to start working on projects at the Apache Software Foundation. And I've done a number of different things at the Apache Software Foundation. Right now, I am the vice president of infrastructure. I'm a former member of the board of directors. I am a project management committee member of a number of different projects, including the incubator and uh, a couple of cloud-related projects. Um, that doesn't mean I know everything about open source, but uh, I, I've done a number of different things within various open source communities. Um, I've been employed by software companies. I've been employed by companies who just use technology. And right now I'm employed by the Linux Foundation. So to kind of frame our um, kind of frame our conversation, I want to talk uh, about some historical items. And I think this really um, this really sets up uh, our larger conversation around security and around uh, just the the vitality of open source in general. Um, so I don't know if you still remember this uh, logo. Um, uh, this is the Heartbleed logo. Uh, this was uh, a vulnerability that was disclosed in 2014 in the OpenSSL library. Uh, this particular library is basically the common underpinning for both um, secure socket layer and transport layer security protocols. And um, essentially this allowed, um, allowed folks 
to compromise encryption, whether the um, whether you were talking about a vulnerable client or a vulnerable server, and it was uh, it was it made a lot of news. This was one of the first security vulnerabilities that had someone create a logo for it. And uh, Forbes columnist Joseph Steinberg uh, wrote uh, that people would argue that Heartbleed is the worst vulnerability found in terms of its potential impact since commercial traffic began on the internet. And I want you to, to think about the, uh, the impact, not just uh, to these systems, but to end users, because essentially we had to uh, upgrade every end user uh, point. We had to upgrade tons of servers that were serving content. And OpenSSL was really a foundational library for just getting things done. Uh, frankly, people assumed it was there and, and kept moving on. Uh, talk about one more real quickly, um, and that's uh, Shellshock. And Shellshock was a, a vulnerability in Bash, which is a, um, a shell environment uh, that you see on Unix systems. And um, this one is particularly... Um, a particularly interesting study because the vulnerability that existed uh, lived in the code for two decades before being discovered. Uh, if, you, if you've read a number of the treatises on open source, particularly um, uh, Eric Raymond, who wrote Cathedral in the Bazaar, which you know, most people consider that to be one of the foundational documents uh, that brought about what we consider open source uh, into the mainstream. And he said that with enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. And yet this flaw, which was an incredible flaw that allowed uh, a lot of abuse of, um, of the bash shell. Um, and it existed for more than two decades. Of course, this calls into question, you know, is open source safe? Can you trust it? And uh, there's a lot of those debates that go on. Uh, personally, I think that uh, there's not a lot of difference in that particular regard uh, between open source and proprietary software, except that people can go look. Uh, there's a computer science professor at Columbia University who said that um, in the case of Bash, we had lots of eyeballs looking, but all of those eyeballs were looking at new features rather than the, uh, the quality of the old code and the security of the old code. And indeed, when we go back and look at uh, Heartbleed, there had been more than $1 million poured into the development of Heartbleed in the five-year period before Heartbleed was disclosed. But it was all around adding new functionality and new features to the SSL library, the open SSL library. And so we had plenty of ongoing development, but no one paying attention to the historical or the, the code base that did exist and whether that was being managed. Um, we'll talk about, talk about one more here. Uh, this is uh, a little over a year and a half old now. Um, ProPublica came back and said, the world's email encryption software relies on one guy. And that guy's going broke. And they proceeded to tell the story of, uh, of Mr. Koch's uh, history with GNU PG and how he had had an intern at one point but can no longer afford to pay him and how he was uh, basically uh, making just a little bit more than minimum wage uh, in the U.S. Obviously, he's in Germany, so uh, slight difference there, but he was making the equivalent of just a little more than minimum wage. And yet he had been the one guy who had been maintaining this encryption library for years. And if you're on a Unix system, you've almost certainly um, made use of this library. Um, and you know, frankly, uh, I saw this article first on Hacker News, and I was kind of shocked. You know, after Heartbleed, and after Shellshock, 
have we not learned anything? And um, I, I think what we, what I took away from that is that there was a lot that we just weren't, weren't learning uh, you know, from all of these experiences and that we were taking a lot of it for granted. Of course, there's, there's some other examples uh, that aren't necessarily security related, right? Um, Codehouse.org is or was a large uh, place where open source software was maintained. They provided bug trackers and code repositories and, and a number of other um, resources. And essentially it became too expensive uh, for the maintainer to continue providing that service. And uh, he was paying out of his own pocket to host servers, even though some people were giving him free resources uh, to, to stand servers up. It wasn't enough. The demand for the code was great, but the support for keeping that code up was not there. Uh, and in true geek fashion, I like this one uh, the best. Uh, I felt a great disturbance in the force as if millions of links suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. And from a historical perspective, you know, we effectively lost a lot of that content that was very valuable both to the projects and to the user communities that existed. Um, so just to give you a frame of reference, uh, there were hundreds of projects at Codehouse they had a number of donors, uh, but the, the primary lead of Codehouse was still spending $1,000 more per month than what was being taken in and donated. And they were a victim of their own success. Uh, the open source software that they hosted uh, was so successful, it was uh, driving bandwidth costs up, it was driving hosting costs, more and more servers were needed. So, you know, when we talk about um, open source and open source success, there's more to it than the number of people downloading it and the number of people using it. And uh, at the Apache Software Foundation, that's something that we care about. We care about the overall project help, uh, not just that there are people using the software, but that there are people maintaining the software. When I was a member of the board of directors, one of the things that we uh, cared about greatly was, uh, is the community, the project community, paying attention to what's going on? If people report security vulnerabilities, are they being fixed? Are they making regular releases so that you know, not just new features, but that the software is being maintained in general? And uh, the Apache Software Foundation has a huge number of projects. Uh, there are roughly 350 uh, individual products, uh, software products that you can download. Uh, they include things like uh, Tomcat, Hadoop, the Apache web server, and scores of others that you know, are either foundational libraries uh, that if you're a Java programmer, you're certainly using. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're using um, a application server or a NoSQL database or anything in the big data space, you're almost certainly using an Apache product. And at the same time, the Apache Software Foundation is huge and has grown so much in the past few years that every month uh, a, the board of directors has 70 reports to review. And sustainability has become a huge concern because we want to make sure that uh, our users that we feel responsible to are uh, getting software that is actually viable. And if it's not, we have a process for that called the attic. You know, just because code is, is being ignored now does not make it inherently bad code. But we want our users to at least have uh, the informed decision making available to them that allows them to say, hey, I know this isn't maintained anymore and then make a choice about whether to use it or not. Uh, we call that process the attic. And uh, you know, much like uh, folks' uh, attics in a house, uh, stuff gets stored up there, and uh, it's probably not very actively used or very actively maintained, but it's a great storage space. And we 
are particularly sensitive about security issues in that regard. Um, and so one of the things I started caring about pretty heavily is, you know, how diverse is that community? How many people are paying attention to it? And one of the folks who uh, works for me as an infrastructure staff member is also a little bit of a statistics geek. And he started calculating what he termed as the pony factor. And so the pony factor is essentially a calculation of um, where 50% of the code base has been developed over the past few years. And uh, what is the smallest number of contributors that developed 50% of the code base? And, and it was kind of surprising, um, kind of surprising what we saw. So I'll, I'll bring up one graph here. These are all uh, Apache projects. Um, I'm particularly proud, so I was heavily involved in CloudStack for a number of years. I was very happy that it took 17 individuals to comprise 50% of the code base. That's a very um, vibrant code base, in my opinion. Uh, and you know, these are these are uh, slightly dated now, but Hadoop, 13 people to uh, to write 50% of the code base, and I think this is timed over two years. Uh, so you know, we had a number of places where this was a great number. It looked like a very vibrant community, and uh, you know, it was clear that one person getting hit by a bus would not uh, would not destroy a project. Uh, we then looked at a couple of others, though, and you know, again, we have some extremes here, right? Uh, we have Linux on the one hand, uh, where. 50% of the code coming in to a single release at this point um, is done by 11 people. And that's still, uh, in terms of changed code over two years, that's still a, a very large number. Um, at the same time, we have others like Git. Git's one of the most incredible, uh, uh, incredibly successful version control systems out there. And yet, at least when this graph was generated, uh, there was one person who was responsible for 50% of that code. And, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of people at the Apache Software Foundation who like to say, hey, why don't you go back and look at how many people it took for subversion. Um, uh, subversion is uh, seven people in this graph uh, compared to the one for Git. And, and why is that? Um, why are people not caring enough about uh, these projects to contribute and invest? And why are these projects not more, um, don't have a, uh, a greater number of people caring and actually uh, exerting some uh, force into making sure that these are good projects? And uh, so by training, I, I was an accounting major in in college and uh, really enjoyed the study of economics um, and it's between the DevOps movement and uh, open source software I've really come to learn that we may have lots of new technology but there are not really that many different things out there um, I see the DevOps people going after 1940s uh, manufacturing workbooks by Deming and thinking it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but it's been around for 70 years now. And similarly, I found that an economic principle was really describing what was happening here. And so this economic principle is called the tragedy of the commons. And it dates all the way back to the mid 1800s. Uh, an English economist, William Forster Lloyd, uh, published a pamphlet by this name. And, uh, Essentially, what he discovered is uh, that you know there were these common grazing grounds in in the UK and uh, where everyone could bring their livestock to come and graze, and that these particular common areas were uh, typically incredibly overgrazed. No one took responsibility to ensure uh, that there was sustainable grazing that was happening. 
uh, it was essentially seen as free food. And, uh, and essentially it, it laid waste to this common resource. Uh, even though it was supposed to be shared by all, everyone was consuming from it and no one was ensuring that, you know, there was going to be something else to eat. Uh, at that grazing ground down the road. Um, in 1968, an ecologist uh, expounded upon this and said, hey, this applies to the environment in general. And he, he stated it very eloquently, I think. It's a situation where individuals acting independently and rationally, according to each, is, each person's self-interest, behave contrary to the best interest of the whole group by depleting some common resource. And I think this, uh, that is the best statement when we look at things like uh, shell shock and heart bleed. Yes, you know, it, it's great that we should be able to consume all of these resources and to consume them for free. Um, in our, if we're looking at our own best interest, that is our best interest, is to get these things for free, but it's not necessarily in the best interest of the entire group. And, you know, I, I think that we're really at an inflection point in open source software. Um, and I, frankly, I think uh, it's amazing where open source has come. Uh, when I look at, when I look at open source, I see you know, we're really close uh, to revolutionizing the world. You have a, the venture capitalist Mark Andreessen saying software is eating the world. Um, and we see uh, open source has now become the de facto model for cloud or big data or SDN or machine learning. Those have become the, the development methodology that people are using to develop new technology. Uh, it, it seems like there is very little proprietary software uh, that is cutting edge these days that people are going out and, and showing some cool new thing and, and making it proprietary because we've learned that open source is a much faster way to innovate uh, because for better or worse, uh, the smartest people in the world probably don't work at our organization. Uh, at least not all of them, right? And so we can benefit from leveraging the intelligence uh, and the contributions of others. And so Mark says software is eating the world, and I, I tend to agree with that. Um, you know, we've, there's basically nothing that you can manufacture anymore that does not involve software, whether that be a TV, um, uh, you know, refrigerators, uh, we have smart refrigerators, we even have smart light bulbs, and you can't do that without including software. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ibrahim Haddad, who works at Samsung, uh, extrapolated once more on that and said that software is not just eating the world, but open source software is eating the world. Um, because all of this new technology, whether it be the light bulbs or the TVs, the refrigerators, uh, or software-defined networks or big data, all of that seems to be innovating in open source, or at least providing uh, the foundational layer of open source. When you look at your phone, and you know, you, if you go and peer into what licenses are used, you see uh, page after page of uh, open source components that are used to assemble the phone, and that's true whether you have uh, an iPhone or an Android device or uh, you know, one of the others, is that they've essentially used open source software to build that stack, even if it's not completely open source. And he also went on to say that you cannot build a product today without open source. Uh, I think this is certainly the rule. There may be a few exceptions out there. Uh, but you cannot build a technology product today, certainly, without touching open source in some way. And so when we look at open source, we've gone from you know, groups of hobbyists, uh, people who were going to build something that wasn't going to be professional, to essentially powering uh, most of the world today. 
So I also want to offer some contrast, right? So we have this situation where open source has taken over the world. Uh, everything that gets developed uh, in terms of products uh, tends to touch um, open source, at least, if not be uh, completely open source in the case of software. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, some contrast with some of the other things going on in the world. First, uh, Google has done the world an incredible service by creating these web fonts uh, that are freely available. Um, but just in just to contrast this, um, there is um, there's more in terms of uh, developer time dedicated to optimizing font size, colors, icons, and other trivial details of ads and apps that Google produces than, uh, than the total amount of time and resources that OpenSSL developers have spent over the lifetime of their project. Uh, so think about that in, um, think about that in contrast. We care more about how an ad is presented to us uh, then we care about uh, the encryption of our traffic over the internet, and that is not to—that's not to say anything bad about Google. Google invests a ton in open source, um, but as a society, it points to where we are in terms of uh, prioritization, right? Um, Arby's, uh, the the mass producers of roasted beast sandwiches. Uh, their web team, there's more in terms of time and, um, uh, and effort and money allocated to their web development team for Arby's.com than, uh, than OpenSSL receives in developer resources in an entire year. Now, I am not suggesting that we want Arby's sandwich artists contributing to the OpenSSL project, but in terms of how we allocate resources to work on things, uh, you know, it's striking to me that we care more about advertising um, fast food sandwiches than we do about ensuring that our traffic is properly encrypted over the internet. Um, and that, that kind of gets us to this point, you know, I, I talked about Pony Factor uh, a little earlier where we measure the number of people. Uh, there are some folks uh, from a university in Spain uh, who also have an open source project called Beturgia who have developed uh, a standard called the, uh, the Elephant Factor. Uh, and that measures how many companies are, are producing 50% of a, a given code base over a couple of years. And, you know, because a company could decide that they are going to change strategy and it deleteriously affect an open source project. Uh, it could dry up you know, the majority of contributors to a project and suddenly the outlook is very different. So I told you a little earlier that um, my standpoint has been uh, largely coming from an operations perspective. And that's true. I, I, uh, I often describe myself as a recovering sysadmin and as a person who has had to bear responsibility for the security and stability of user-facing services. Um, things like Pony Factor and Elephant Factor matter to me. Um, I want to... Uh, I, I don't want to deploy a system that users are going to come to rely on, that I'm going to be expected to support and to secure, only to find out that, hey, there's one guy living in the forest of Germany who pays attention to this when he can afford to. Uh, and unfortunately, that has become quite an expensive proposition. Uh, if you had said, hey, I, I have a web server and I serve web content and it's important that it be encrypted, you would probably not look at the OpenSSL encryption library. Maybe you would. Maybe you should. I, I'm sure in hindsight we all think that we would have. Uh, you would probably look at the web server. Hey, is the 
Nginx web server or the Apache web server or IIS, is that well maintained? Um, how often do we go into the, the smaller, um, smaller components? Uh, and so that poses a difficulty. How do we find out uh, what the truly important things that we need to be watching are? Are things like Bash important? Well, they are for all of the embedded devices that shipped with it. They certainly are for all of the, the Unix machines that are running it. Um, and yet you've got essentially this situation where we can freely consume uh, and and frankly, many times we don't have a good way to determine if we, uh, how vital that piece of software is or even what component pieces uh, put us at risk. Um, but I want to pose a couple of ideas. Um, so first of all, there Hi, is a David? ton. Yes. Uh, sorry, before, before we continue, uh, Vaughn had a question here. Uh, sure. GitHub passed 10 million repos back in 2013 with a growth rate, growth rate that says we're well past that now. Are we spreading mm -hmm. ourselves too thin? Um, Vaughn, my personal take on that is I think the answer is yes. I, I think um, so, and I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you a couple of different perspectives on this. Uh, the first is is that people should be free to innovate as they see fit, right? Um, and it's always difficult putting yourself in a place of picking the winners versus the losers. And in many ways, we want the market to do that. Um, the problem with open source is that there's no clear way to differentiate between a winner and loser. And the reason I say that is with GitHub, there is zero cost to throwing up a code repository and it's also incredibly difficult for you to look at um, some competing uh, software projects and determine which one is better you know which one meets your needs from a technical perspective and also has a vital community and um, there's a there's a saying at the Apache Software Foundation that we do not pick winners we pick runners, and those people are happy to run. Uh, but in most open source, um, in most open source contexts, there's no one that says, "Hey, you don't have enough people paying attention to this project for you to to keep this operational. You should clearly tell people this isn't being paid attention to." As a matter of fact, most people would tell you to mind your own business, right? Um, this is the project that I'm working on, and I've sunk my time into it, and uh, you know, how dare you come and complain about the number of people who contribute? Um, so, yes, I, I don't know that I have a solution to uh, to the fact that we're spreading ourselves so thin. There, um, I think that there's a ton of opportunity. Uh, I think a lot of this comes back to the market deciding what's going to be successful and what's not. Although sadly because of the, the fact that so much is low cost um, and, or zero cost, um, we end up with you know, this abundance of things that are effectively left to rot. Um, you know, when we look at VHS versus Betamax, that easily has a winner. Even if it wasn't the technical superior winner, it is the one that uh, we continue to see are we continue to see? I guess it's it is certainly legacy now. Um, we continue to see people producing things for, and Betamax faded into the background, and suddenly it became very difficult to get a Betamax player or pre-recorded media on the Betamax format. Uh, and there was a clear winner there based upon uh, based upon the people producing content for it. And we don't have that same uh, we don't have that same uh, ability to basically deprioritize things that are not going to be well supported by various communities. Um, you can go to GitHub and you can find software I wrote uh, probably six years ago and it's still on GitHub. 
it might be useful to someone. It might not be. Um, but even on the things that are winning from an adoption standpoint, I'd argue that we're still not prioritizing those and developing to those uh, as we should. Um, I, I talked a little bit about how OpenSSL has had a million dollars in development resources uh, put towards it. Uh, and all of that was shunted towards new development. So even if we said we're only going to have one or maybe two encryption libraries, uh, I, I don't know that that solves the problem. And I think that uh, as a, um, for lack of a better word, as a society of folks who are consuming this technology, we have to become smarter about um, where we're going to invest. And similar to uh, the environment, although probably without the same dire consequences, um, we've got to determine that, you know, just because we can doesn't mean that we should, and that there are some actions that we should take to benefit ourselves long term. Um, and so I, I think uh, I think there are a couple of ideas that you can that we should shift our thinking to. Um, the first is if you actually depend your business, your organization uh, depends upon software, uh, and particularly if it's open source software you need to be a part of that equation. You need to at least have an active part in figuring out, is someone paying attention to what's going on? Um, it is not lost on me that some of the largest uh, companies on the web were using OpenSSL but not contributing to it or contributing only new features to it. Um, and it's vital to everything they do. You know, no one wants, uh, no one wants payment card fraud, uh, no one wants uh, the loss of privacy or the, the bad outcomes that come from uh, compromised security, but you know, allocating a single head to work on OpenSSL is apparently very difficult to do. Uh, and a lot of that comes back to the way that we measure uh, whether we're being effective or not. So I think there's a ton of opportunity uh, to become part of a critical software project. Um, there are so many of those out there that no one is paying attention to or very few people are paying attention to that you sh could come in and very easily become a critical uh, part of a software project. Um, in recent years, uh, we've also seen um, We've seen things like the core infrastructure initiative. And as a disclaimer, uh, this is something that is uh, handled out of or managed by the Linux Foundation. Um, I don't work anywhere near that. So, uh, but I, in, uh, just to fully disclose, that is something that my employer uh, manages. And that is essentially a group of companies who come together and say, hey, we know that we need to be uh, we need to be looking at the things that make up the elements of our infrastructure, and we need to ensure that they have adequate amounts of attention. And whether that's funding developers to work on OpenSSL or GNU PG, um, essentially it's companies like Facebook and Google and, and others who are uh, combining money, figuring out you know, as a group, what are the priorities that we care about, uh, that, that we think the web or the internet or computing in general rely on, and how do we best uh, ensure that it receives the adequate amount of attention? Um, on a smaller scale, though, um, I think you need to be making the case that your organization must invest. Uh, there is no such thing as a free lunch, and just because you can download software uh, does not make it free. There are clearly implementation costs, which I think companies understand um, and organizations understand. Uh, but I, I think that uh, uh, I, I think that we essentially have <clears throat> a situation where organizations have to come to the understanding that uh, that they they have to make an investment 
in ensuring that this remains uh, this common resource, right? Uh, much like the, the grazing pastures in the UK, when they were common, if you intend for them to remain something that people can use, um, then they're going to have to they're going to have to invest in ensuring that it remains viable. And I see a uh, I, I see a question from Rajiv about liability laws. Um, so first of all, most um, most liability laws uh, are look at the agreement that comes with your software, whether it's proprietary or whether it's open source, and they all disclaim any liability. They all tell you that they make no representations as to whether any piece of software is suitable for any given task, and um, uh, so most software starts out with the disclaimer, right? Uh, that's true in, in virtually everything I've seen out there. Uh, in terms of liability, um, my personal perspective is that um, you know, being able to uh, use liability to force a company to do something, um, that works well as a punitive um, measure, but it's also, um, you know, so if you look at that from um, from an environmental standpoint, it's only after the damage is already done that that comes into play. There's obviously the threat of liability, um, but, uh, you know, frankly, if the threat of liability was enough to, to stop bad actors, um, then I don't think we would have nearly the problems that we do because we have liability or we have negative repercussions for so many things. Um, instead, I think that people, um, most of those, right? So most of those require an action. And what we're really talking about is uh, organizations and individuals failing to act, failing to do anything. And Frankly, they've been explicitly told that they don't have to do anything. Take my software for free. If you find it useful, feel free to use it. Uh, there is no obligation on the person to, uh, to get involved and to, uh, to contribute back. And I think that what we need to do is get away from that focus on uh, doing what is um, in the best interest of that individual person or that individual organization and looking at the ecosystem of software that's out there. Uh, and I also think that um, all of that liability would also, um, would also uh, shunt innovation. Uh, I would hate to see someone who has a great idea for uh, a great new type of software, not be able to uh, bring that to market uh, because they uh, because they were worried about the liability of publishing something and then it never being updated. Because at the end of the day, right, uh, when you start talking about liability and you look at comparative liability, uh, there is, I would think that uh, we would tend to find more fault with the people who publish the software than with those who use the software. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's, my, that's my personal take. I don't think uh, straight liability will do it. Maybe survival will. Um, I guess that remains to be seen. Um, but when I talk about making a case that your organization must invest, um, this does not seem to be uh, as much of a problem in the physical world, right? Um, obviously, there's an upfront cost when you buy a building uh, for a company to work in. And they also understand that there is an ongoing maintenance cost. People have to clean. People have to ensure that uh, the lines in the parking lot remain painted, that you know every so many years, the walls will be painted, that uh, holes in the roof will need to get patched. Uh, we understand that, and I think we have disconnected um, disconnected 
uh, from uh, any thoughts of that because we're dealing with essentially what are virtual resources. And so when I'm talking about making a case that your organization must invest, uh, the obvious way is um, pay a vendor and you know, pay somebody to be paying attention. Uh, this is certainly the business model that Red Hat uses. They are, uh, they are saying, pay us and we will, we will manage all of that uh, for security and for a number of other things to ensure that you know, you're not using something that's dead end. Um, but uh, as Jenny has pointed out, um, you can also contribute upstream, right? You can, you can uh, allow some of your developers or uh, QA folks to spend some time on those things that are actually vital to you. Um, personally, I do not understand, a, particularly a technology organization, can, um, can make the argument that they don't need to invest in contributing upstream to something that is vital to their business. Um, you know, we, we wouldn't uh, dream of uh, not being on a standards body for our industry, right? Uh, there is no one who would not join uh, a standards body if all of their money depended upon that. So why would we not join a, um, a open source software project uh, that, um, that was providing us with tremendous value uh, in the form of free software that we can then, our, our software that is free of charge that we can then use and deploy uh, to help us earn that money. Um, that seems like uh, at least negligence to me. Um, you know, that uh, I, I don't understand how we have arrived at the point where we ignore that. And I, I actually think that this is from a financial and from a um, fiduciary standpoint, that this is worse than mismanaging the environment. Uh, obviously, the, the impact uh, down the road is different. But from a fiduciary standpoint, um, those things actually earn us money. And uh, ignoring them or relying on someone else to uh, certainly sounds like negligence in my, from my viewpoint. Um, uh, Susan's pointing out that uh, you know, one of the bonuses in donating people hours is spreading out the knowledge of a body of software. And I certainly think that's true. I think that uh, aside to that is that not only are you developing expertise, but you're developing uh, uh, influence and you can affect the future direction of a piece of software, which may give you a competitive advantage down the road, or it may allow you to have an influence that improves your standing um, and uh, have that effect. Um, uh, and she points out, I think from her experience, uh, with, um, with NTP that, uh, there are very few people who <laughs> understand how NTP is supposed to work and the consensus algorithms there for coming up with what time it really is. Uh, and yes, we, we have this situation where you know, we have a lot of folks who, have been involved and are super smart at their specific area of technology. And even in the open source realm, those folks are starting to get older and they're wanting to retire. And quite honestly, they're forgetting, you know, not because of old age, but because they're not doing it anymore. They're forgetting all of the things that they've learned and we're losing out on a lot of that, uh, a lot of that knowledge. Um, and I agree, Vaughn, uh, you know, applying, uh, Applying liability to open source without chilling is, is going to be problematic. Um, this is, you know, uh, I don't claim to have solutions aside from a couple of ideas that may help us mitigate some of these challenges. Um, uh, but hopefully this starts a conversation that we can start having. Um, and, uh, you know, we can... Uh, we can hopefully start uh, start figuring out how we 
don't have a tragedy of the commons in open source and in technology. Um, here's my contact info again. If you have questions, I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to listen, uh, answer questions. We have a few minutes left. Um, again, feel free to contact me. Feel free to disagree with me. Um, I'm happy to be told that I'm wrong and, and that uh, there are better ideas out there because there probably are. I see multiple attendees okay. are typing. So. Yeah, so let's um, just go over a couple of notes and we'll let these questions queue up. I sure. just threw a, a quick poll up there. Uh, I don't know. If, it looks like you guys can see it because I see some responses came in. I was asking if any of you guys are a member of an open source project. So we have a few responses. Um, if you wouldn't mind just also uh, responding with the name of the project. I, for example, am, am part of the Bro Project. So I found a lot of the points that you were making very, very important. So thank you very much for making the case for us. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so let's see. Um, let's go back to uh, Rajiv. The idea was to switch liability for most open source innovators to users of the software. Uh, I think he was just clarifying a point. And Vaughn says, interesting, by users you mean those embedding in other software or end users. Rajiv says, in other words, if you build on or provide commercial products on open source software, would, would they bear the liability? So I think that our existing legal system, uh, at least in the U.S., and, and what I know of uh, the U.S. legal system is poorly suited to deal with that today. Um, and, and James just said, part of the problem is the success of open source marketing. I think that's true, but I think um, I think the human nature also comes into play where we see something that's free of charge and we're excited because we can consume it. Um, there's actually uh, another, another British uh, origin to an economic theory is called Jevons Paradox, which says that the easier it is to consume something, the more you will consume of it. And so um, because it costs nothing to consume open source software, or at least it has the perception of nothing uh, in terms of cost, uh, people will consume more and more of it. And I think that's true. I think we have, um, uh, we've gotten to the point where open source is touching everything and we still have that uh, that problem. Um, and and he, the the next line is I personally would not have thought that core tools needed help when they come from Apache Linux etc. And I think that everyone else shares that assumption. Everyone uses OpenSSL, so surely someone else is taking responsibility, right? And when everyone is responsible, no one is. Um, and I think that uh, I think that that is true everywhere. And I think that assumption is made whether you're a giant behemoth or whether you're, um, you know, a single person using a, a piece of software. Oh well, those guys, um, those guys are doing it. And I can tell you uh, just from having read the reports that you would probably be surprised at how many um, heavily used projects suffer for contributors and they don't make a big deal of it. Nobody's writing pieces in ProPublica about them that there's only one guy in Germany in the middle of the Black Forest who um, is basically living on minimum wage trying to put project through. Um, you know, I, I just don't think that there's a ton of that uh, happening. Uh, but I would say that it's probably more common than we realize. Um, uh, and uh, there's, I don't think that it's by the download uh, button, James, uh, but in terms of statistics, uh, there's a number of places that do that. Uh, I'd encourage you to check out Baturgia. And uh, I'll type that because it's uh, uh, it's got uh, a lot of statistics. They're doing that on a lot of different things. Um, 
Black Duck has um, uh, Olo uh, that does uh, something. Uh, they at least capture statistics, uh, and you'll see um, you'll see a number of others there. But I also I'm somewhat worried about statistics because I don't think that they necessarily tell us everything that that uh, we need to know. Um, Pony factor being a great example, right? So it's looking at total number of contributions uh, over a period of time and where they're coming from. It's not telling you, is it getting enough attention? Did five people commit one line changes and thus we have five people uh, wrote 50% of the code in the past year? Uh, it doesn't tell you that. Uh, and so in isolation, those are not enough and, and they are interesting pieces of information, um, but they're not, uh, they're not truly enough to make an informed decision by itself. So, um, I, I'd be worried that, uh, that, you know, even if we put that up by the download button, it would not be enough to inform and that people would then say, oh, well, you know, the pony factor for that project is 23, so I don't have to worry about that particular project. It's clearly vital, despite the fact that you know, maybe nobody's touched it in six months, but over the past two years, there have been a couple of people who committed document changes. Um, um, Susan says that she sees a lot of... Uh, folks find these critical projects intimidating. Um, I think that that's true. I think that it's really hard to come in when, you know, the guy who's been doing it for 20 years and, and has forgotten more about encryption than most of us will ever be able to absorb is sitting there. Uh, but I also think that there are a number of different places where people can get involved in a project. It does not have to all be, um, you know, really hardcore uh, encryption algorithms. And it's not just that, uh, that there's only um, one project that you need to focus on. Um, most people have a technology stack that involves a lot of different layers, everything from hardware on up. Um, and uh, I think that that's, uh, there are plenty of places to get involved and the problem shouldn't be, uh, there's no place to get involved. Uh, but uh, I think you'll find that in most projects, if a new person shows up and says, hey, I want to get involved and I'd like to help, I'm not sure where to start, that uh, you'll probably not find written documentation for that, but you'll find that people are more than willing to point you to the easy bugs to get you used to the code base or the easy, you know, help us document how we actually build this. Uh, you'd be surprised how many uh, projects out there don't even have uh, basic build instructions. So um, uh, it, it is a cultural problem to overcome, uh, but it is not. Uh, uh, it is a. It is not impossible uh, to get started. Um, there are a number of projects like Open Hatch and um, there's another one that try and make that uh, introduction to contributing to open source easy. And once you've done it with one project, the next project gets even easier, etc. Um, frankly, I wish that we had more um, educational institutions that started familiarizing folks with just the way of how to participate in an open source project, uh, having them practically involved in an open source so that you know, they don't see kernel developers as minor deities um, and you know, it's all foreign and strange and they have no clue as to how to interact with them. Um, and Jenny's pointing out that uh, uh, understanding how software affects your business and risk posture. I wholeheartedly agree. I, I wish that there was actually a, uh, um, 
a group of folks who understood that and could, could put forth a methodology for uh, understanding that. But I think most of that is relegated to M&A lawyers who do analysis of legal risk and not, uh, not anything else. Okay, we are, uh, we are going over a little bit, so I want to just uh, thank everybody for coming to this webinar, and uh, I just want to go over some basic uh, notes here. First, uh, we're, still, we're still maybe wrapping up uh, last minute questions or, or thank yous. Uh, we also have a survey that we would like people to take. Um, let me actually post this link in the chat because then it, it'll be clickable. Here we go, survey. There it is. So if you wouldn't mind uh, giving us some feedback. And uh, if, if you enjoyed this presentation, we were, are seeking presenters and topics. So please take advantage of the survey and tell us your thoughts. Also, uh, please come to our website to see uh, previous uh, presentations or see upcoming events, we are at trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is October 24th at 11 at the same time. And the topic is Science or Security by George Strong. And you might have heard his name before. He is, Dr. Strong is the Director of the Federal Networking and IT Research and Development National Coordination Office. So he will be presenting next month, and registration information for that presentation will be in a couple weeks. Uh, David, do you have any last-minute comments or anything like that? I, I wanted to say thank you for attending, especially on a Monday uh, morning. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate the invitation. I hope it was useful. Uh, feel free to get in touch if I can, uh, if I can help any of you folks. Uh, I'd be happy to do so. Great. Well, uh, with that, I will conclude this meeting. Thank you, everyone, for attending.